we are starting a new series. Whoop, whoop. New series. We got, do we have artwork up for it? Work. There it is. Okay. Finding your hunger. What the Lord put on my heart is we're getting into the fall season of a lot of activities is that uh, that a lot of times God can call us in the seasons of our life and things that we have to do or or, or engage with him, come alongside, partner with him in things. And it can seem like this huge mountain that we have to climb. It can seem like a lot of work. It can seem overwhelming. Um, and and I, has anybody been rock climbing, like with real like ropes? And telling, like, it's it's intense. Like, I, I had one buddy who was, like, nationally ranked at one point, and he moved to town back when I was living with him. It was probably about 15 years ago. And uh, just real skinny dude, like a spider. And like he would just he would just fly up these rocks, and he's like, "Oh yeah, Caleb, just come rock climbing with me." I was like, "Sure." He's like, "I'll take you to a beginner spot in Mazama." And I remember going out there, and it's like this 80, 85 foot rock that kind of like swells out a little bit and goes up. And he's like, "Yeah." So like every 15, sometimes 20 feet, there's a little hook that you hook into, and that'll keep you from falling any farther than that one. I'm like, "So what do you do between these little moments?" And he goes, "Oh, you just don't fall." He's like, <laughs> you just don't fall. And, 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 and I, I was terrified. And, and, and I have to admit, I got about halfway up. And, and I, this is before I did landslide prevention. I still had a very healthy fear of heights. And I was about 40 feet off the ground. And my hands are hurting. My knees are shaking. And I'm getting to this spot where it's starting to curve out a little bit. And it's getting a little more smooth, a little more technical. And this is the beginner. I, I'm not doing a route. I'm just anything I can get my hands and feet into. I'm trying to just not fall off this rock. And I'm losing it. He's like, you're just going to have to fall. And I only had like five feet, but I was just terrified. I was so terrified of falling. And it took me probably about two, three minutes. And, and really, if I look back, I probably fell more because I just ran out of strength than actually having the faith to go, okay, I'm going to trust this little hook and trust him on the ground not to let me fall all the way down. And I think I just kind of like, I just couldn't hold on. So I just like <gasps> held my breath and fell. And harnesses are a lifesaver, but they're not nice. <laughs> and so I fell. I have not been rock climbing since. I think sometimes God can call us into things, and it can seem that way, though. Like, we, we, we face this mountain, and maybe we've taken a step once. You, you've pursued something that you felt God calls you to, and it, and it didn't quite work out like you thought you did. It, it would. And, and it, and it kind of scares us away, and we can just step away. Maybe you've shared, maybe you shared the gospel once, and you just got blown up, and you're like, man, I just, I'll just love on people. I'm not going to share about Jesus anymore verbally. I'm just going to love on people, and they'll, they'll just they'll see it. You know, um, or maybe you tried to reconcile with a relationship that blew up in your face. There's so many things that we have. Well, maybe we try it, and it doesn't quite work out the first time. And, and we can lose our hunger. We can lose kind of the, the desire to pursue things. Sometimes we can have just a great desire for something. And so we discipline ourselves. We, we pursue it passionately. But we find ourselves in the midst of the struggle of how hard it is, of disappointments and setbacks. The hunger dies. It starts to fade away. And so in this series, our, our entire hope is to help rekindle a hunger, to kind of just point to Jesus, uh, to point to the things the Lord has done in different people's lives and different situations in Scripture, to look at these stories and see how, how can we see that God is still faithful, that He is still true, that His Word stands, that His promises are, are completely trustworthy. And that if we pursue him according to his word, and if we follow him full of faith, that he will do exactly what he said he was going to do. We want to rekindle hunger. Because when we're hungry, like, I don't know about you, I, I get hangry. I have uh, blood sugar problems. Like, if I get hungry, I get nasty. Not as much anymore. When I was a kid, like, my mom used to talk to me, she like, oh, you need to have a piece of cheese. And get you some cheese and some chocolate milk right now, because I am not dealing with this attitude anymore, young man. And she, she knew if I was getting sassy, I was a pretty good kid. But usually it was, <laughs> Joel, <laughs> your, mom, your mom threw you under the bus. That if I got a little food in me, I was going to do okay. When I was fighting professionally, the thing I hated most was cutting weight. I fought it about 150 to 152 pounds, depending on the belts that doesn't matter. So I had to get really thin. I walked around about 168. And I would always start weight cutting about three weeks in advance. And I'd have to lose anywhere from 15 to I think the most I lost for a fight was 18 pounds in three weeks to, to get ready for these fights. And it was torture. 
And I dealt with physical hunger all the time. But the reason I did is I was hungry for the reward of what I knew would happen if I made weight and I trained the way I needed to train, that there was victory on the other side, that all that sacrifice, all that effort, all that work was worth it. Hunger can get you to do things that you normally wouldn't do. I would never live that lifestyle on a daily basis. But the goal in front of me, the prize, the promise of the competition was something that drove me to put myself through that. And that wasn't always perfect. I'm not talking about a hunger that causes to be perfect. I, I have to confess, I'd be at the gym and I'd be working out. And I'd be on like 1,200 calories and I can't remember anyone's name. I'm giggling at the dumbest jokes. Like my brain is eating itself. There's so little carbs going on. And I'm just, I'm just like a bag of rocks. Like and just, it was just, and I would get these cravings. And I had this connection at the store. And so I'd drive up the Safeway and I'd walk in. And instead of having like no salt, no fat, like everything was raw vegetables, it was awful. And I, I'd go to the store and it felt like I, like I was sneaking around and I would go into the store and there she would be. She'd be right there at the aisle every time. And I'd go and I'd talk to her. I'd be like, I shouldn't do this. And she'd just smile at me. And then I'd do it. And I'd walk out of there feeling like a ho-ho because Mrs. Debbie got me again. <laughs> There's nothing like chocolate Swiss rolls when you can't eat anything. And I would stuff these things. I was like Gollum, just precious. Like one, I can just have one. Why do they come two in a pack? I can only afford the calories of one and this other one's gonna sit here all day by itself lonely. And I would, and then I would feel so guilty. I'd get on the treadmill and I would just run. But like the hunger drove me to, I, I was crazy. Like literally the physical hunger drove me to be crazy. But the hunger of my heart and desire drove me to do those crazy things to see what I wanted to see. And I, and I think, so often, um, we, can, we can want God, right? I mean, all of us are here because on some level, we, we want more of God. We want more of his presence. There, there's a level of desire we have, but, but are we hungry for him? You see, like, I want to lose weight. And I've wanted to lose weight for a year and a half. I'm, I'm 205 right now hasn't moved an inch in a year and a half. I know what to do. I've done it before. I've been working out with Nate for a year and a half. And it hasn't moved an inch because I'm not hungry enough for the goal to actually do what's necessary, which is go back to some of those eating disciplines to make it happen. I think this happens for us, more than we maybe want to admit. But what, what are we really hungry for? I mean, think about it. Are we really hungry for God? Or are we hungry for something else? When, when you're hungry, you will sacrifice other things to obtain the thing you're hungry for. When you're hungry, you will cut out things in your schedule, you will, you will take away pleasure from yourself. You will do whatever it takes to acquire the thing that you're hungry for. And, and maybe for you, it, it, or maybe if you're like me, like maybe you say, like, God, I want more of you, Lord. But it's like, well, what am I willing to actually take out of my life now to have more of him? Am I really hungry? Or do, do I have a genuine desire, but it's not a hunger yet? And if it's not a hunger, why? Because... The, the truth is, is when you're not hungry for something enough to do something about it, it's because you've been satisfying yourself with something lesser. And it's not satisfying because you still have the desire for the thing that's more, but you have enough coming in from something that's weaker. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a copycat. It's a fake. But it's just enough to keep you from getting hungry enough to actually go for the thing you really want. There's things in my life that I know that the Lord wants to do, but unless I can develop a hunger to pursue it, I'm not going to see it. And it's, it's a frustrating place to know that God has made promises and he desires things for me, desires things for my family, more than I desire them, and I'm the one in the midst of them. So we're going to talk about hunger in this series. Pursuit of the Lord. Matthew 5, 6 in the Beatitudes, Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. Jeremiah 29, 
the prophet is speaking to Israel who is in captivity in Babylon. And the Lord says, when you seek me and you will find me, when you seek me with all of your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. When you look for me, you will find me when you look for me with all your heart. When you get so hungry that you will look anywhere, you will sacrifice anything to come and find my presence, there I will be found by you, says the Lord. Last week I talked about Jehoshaphat sending the worshipers out in front of the army to battle and they didn't have to fight. God made this promise. It's interesting that what we didn't talk about too much is that Jehoshaphat went to great lengths for spiritual reform to get all the idols out of the country, went to great lengths to get social reform, to put judgment, judges and officers in every town to make sure people get along with each other. And then he went to great lengths to call the entire country to fast and pray, not for victory, but just to seek the Lord's face. And when the Lord saw the posture of their heart, the hunger they had for him to do what he called them to do, to be the people he called them to be, and to seek his presence above all things. Then he spoke and he says, you don't even have to fight in this battle. But there was a hunger that preceded the promise of God for not a finger to be lifted and victory to be given. There was a hunger that precedes the promises of God in our life. I'm going to be telling the story of the man who was paralyzed and his four buddies dropped him through the roof, if you're familiar with it. It can be found in Matthew 9, 1 through 8, Mark 2, 1 through 12, or Luke 5, 17 through 26. I have combined them to kind of give a full picture. If you want to follow along closely, I recommend Mark, Mark 2, or Luke 5 are probably the more full pictures if you want to stay somewhat with me or try to flip back and forth. But I'm going to be reading from combining the three stories to get the most full picture uh, of what we're looking at here. Because I think here is this, There's an idea and there's some imagery that the Lord wants to use to show us what being hungry for a touch of him in our life looks like. All right, I'm just going to read the whole thing and then we'll come back through it. And it should be up. I think we have it. Yeah. And when Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. They were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus, but finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd. They went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when, they, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son. Your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes and Pharisees were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they had thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you think evil and question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise. Take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them, picked up that mat that he'd been laying on, and went home, glorifying God. And when the crowd saw it, they were afraid and in amazement that seized them all. They glorified God and were filled with the awe for, giving, for God giving such authority to men, saying, we have seen extraordinary things today, and we have never seen anything like this. So we backtrack to the beginning. One of the first things I felt like the Lord shared with me for tonight was just this simple idea is that he was at home. So often, God will be moving somewhere. Maybe there, there is something that's going on at church or there's people you know that are experiencing God or, or just or it's just coming and being a part of the fellowship, but God is moving somewhere. We, you can see that he's doing things in people's lives. He's doing things in the midst of people, and yet I just don't want to go there. I'd rather God just meet me in my prayer closet. I'd rather God just meet me where I'm at because I'm busy and I got things to do, and I just don't have the time to go to where God is moving. You see, it says that these men carried their friend. These four men carried their friend. From a, I can only imagine how far it was. I mean, they, don't, they didn't put him in a car and drive him over to Jesus' house. He was on a mat, 
And they lived in an area where there wasn't many good roads. And it was, Galilee, up in Galilee and Capernaum, around, it is all mountains. The odds are they had to carry this man up and over passes from wherever they were, carrying their friend through hot days, rocks, unstable ground. Four guys had to have enough faith to go look, and they had to have enough hunger for their friend's healing to go, it's worth it to us to just try to get there safely. Furthermore, you have to think, if it takes a while, and they've heard rumors that Jesus is in Capernaum, what confidence do they have that he's still going to even be there when they arrive? And yet they do it anyways. I don't know about you, but there's been times where I feel like the Lord has said, why don't you go up, I want you to come up to the altar, I want you to, I want you to pour yourself out for me. And it's like, man, I've done this so many times, Lord, and, and it, it, nothing seemed to change. I see other people around me get changed, but it, I never seem to change. Lord, why? I just... Can, I'll just, can I talk to you from my seat? Can I talk to you from this place in my life? I don't want to go do the thing that you're calling me to do. I know you're moving in this area over here, or, or, or someone is, is, is speaking. I'm seeing you powerfully move and people over here, but I just I don't want to align myself with that because it's really inconvenient. And I refuse to move from my home into the place where God is actually working in people's lives. Am I alone? And it says that Jesus, the Lord was with him to heal. And I just want to make a quick note on this, is as we talk about hunger in the rest of this series, for the next two months we talk about hunger, and we talk about hunger unleashing uh, just heaven's storehouses and a hunger that heaven cannot ignore. We're not talking about manipulating God and giving us what we want. Jesus' purpose was there to heal, and so these people understanding that went to go meet God where God was moving in the way God was moving. We do not force God's hand. He is sovereign and in control. He loves us and he meets us and he pours in his desires into our hearts. And when we align with him and our hunger aligns with his desires and we start to move in faith and to be willing to actually set stuff aside, cut things out of our schedules, put old habits away so that God can actually do something, it's amazing what God will do. But if we think we do those things and now God has to respond to this hunger we've facilitated in ourselves, disappointment, not divine touch, is what you'll experience. So Jesus was there to heal. He was at home, and they're willing to go this great distance. Willing to go this great distance to go see him. And it's Jesus that is the one that heals in this. The Lord was with Jesus to heal him. Jesus is still the same person we go to. What is it, as we sit here tonight, what is it the thing that you are wanting the Lord to do in your life? What is that thing that you've been, you've been praying about, but if you're honest, if you assess yourself, I haven't been showing up with a hunger to see God do this in my life. What is, what is that place in your heart? Is it, what is the financial burden? Is it, is it, is it physical ailment? Is it, it, what is that thing that maybe you have given up on the hunger and yeah, I'd like God to do this, but I'm no longer pursuing the promise of God that he would be able to provide, that he would be able to heal, that he would be able to speak, that I would be able to hear him, see him move, feel the experience of his love. What is that thing that right now you're seeing? I just want to just take a moment before we continue. What is the thing? Because I want us to hold on to that. What is the thing that's robbing us of our hunger because it's just been too hard, the journey has been too long, and it seems like it's not going anywhere? Second Corinthians 1.20. For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. All the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. Is the thing you want even what God wants for your life? Do you know? See, God's not in the business of fulfilling all our desires. He's in the business of fulfilling all his promises. 
is what you're hungering for even one of the things that God promises and desires for you to have? Where we place our hunger can be a great blessing or a great danger. People can be hungry for career, love Jesus, and lose them on the way. People can be hungry for family time and love Jesus and lose him along the way. All these things are necessary and good, but if we're not hungry for the Lord first and foremost, if we're not willing to make sacrifices to pursue the Lord, you will never possess the promises he has for you. It's that simple. Jesus said, you can do nothing apart from me. There is nothing that he has for you that is outside of his presence and his truth. And so if there's something we're pursuing that doesn't have to do with the promises of God and finding its truth and its purpose and its actual acquisition from Jesus himself, we're not pursuing what the Lord has for us in our life. I know this is real somber, and we're going to okay, get a lot more energy coming up. I just needed to lay this flat. So when we talk about hunger and we get excited, we just don't start to think about our own heart's desires over what the Lord wants to do in our life. It's very important. So these men have carried Jesus all this way. I, I mean, how heavy is this? He's probably not too big. I mean, I don't know however long he's been paralyzed, but I mean, it's four guys probably over a mountain pass. It's hot. It's rocky. They've carried this man all the way, and they get to the house, and they probably can't even hear Jesus because there's so many people crowded around. They might be able to hear whispers, but I, be I bet you they can't hear full sentences, and they're saying all these things, and they definitely can't see him, and there's no hope for them being able to experience his touch. Right? How many times have you felt like in your faith walk or in church that you see people around you, they talk about, I heard from the Lord, the Lord spoke, or I've seen him move so mighty in my life, or I feel the love of the Lord, he's powered out his love, and I'm just, I've never been the same. And you sit there and you go, man, I don't even know what that looks like. I want to hear from the Lord. I want to see him move in my life. I want to see something. I want to experience an actual tangible touch of the love of God in my life that will wreck me to where I'm never the same. I hear people talk about these experiences of God and I feel like I'm like these four men. I'm carrying this burden, this load, this weight. Maybe it's a sin. I'm carrying this thing that I just, I need God to deal with. But no matter how much I've traveled so far, I've done everything I can think of in my mind to do and I understand to do. And I still feel like I can't hear him speak on this issue. I can't see him move in this area of my life, and I can't even imagine what it would be like for him to touch me in this way, to just take it away, or to heal me, or to just provide in a way that, I, that is unexplainable. I, don't, I can't even imagine that anymore, because I've come so far. I've been here so long. I've been pursuing. I've, I feel like I've been hungry, and there's just nothing. Just nothing. I remember I remember there was a season about three years when, when I, was, I, I had been sexually sober for about four or five years. It was about a season, about three years of, uh, of people, like strangers coming out of the woodwork. I'd get one prophetic word every time. God's preparing your life for you. Just wait. It's going to be amazing. And I was starting to like, you, you start to hear promises of God, but then you don't start to see them come through. And they actually start to make you mad. Or I'll confess, they made me mad. I remember I was down in L.A., and this dude taps Brad on the shoulder. He's not even next to me, and he goes, hey, is your buddy married? And Brad goes, no, and he goes, I got a word from the Lord's told me that your wife is being prepared for you. Hold strong. And I remember we're in the middle of worship. It's like it's the Nakia Theater where the Oscars are. It's like there's lights and smoke, and the band is fantastic. And I'm just like, this sucks. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I can't take one more promise about a wife. I'm getting so old. I was like 28, you know, like I'm, I'm getting so old. I know, what was me? I mean, really, you know, this is, it's, it's the young man version of first world problems. Like, whoop de doo kid. I'm like, you're 28, you're not married. <laughs> Cry me a river. And I, but I'm like, I'm so upset. I'm getting so angry with God. He's like, why do you keep saying, I, I just speak about the ministry I keep praying about. I keep praying about ministry. I keep praying about other things that you have me in and that you're actually doing. I actually... Until you started speaking, I was really okay being single. Quit talking to me about getting married. Where is she? Like, it was starting to drive me nuts. 
And I started to get bitter. And, and it was such a beautiful thing because what the Lord had to do is he had to work with my bitterness concerning his promise before he ever provided my bride. Because if he wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't have believed who he gave me with some of the things we went through in our engagement. Sometimes it feels like we're on the outside and there's just, there's, there's no way in. Everyone else can hear from God and experience his love. And there's, I'm not just, I'm, and we start to hear little whispers. It's not for you. It's not for you. And I told you, Jesus doesn't have anything special for you. Your lot is to be miserable. Your lot is to be broke. Your lot is to be depressed. Medication is all you will ever know of freedom from depression. Your lot is to just stand on the outside and be faithful, but God will never use you to do anything great. You've gotten too old now. You've messed up too many times. You're too uneducated. You don't have what it takes, the gifting to know what to do if God would bring it, so he's not going to bring it to you. And you start to just think that being on the outside is your lot in life with the promises of God. Because all the liar is doing is, to, is, is speaking to your current reality in the face of God's promises in your heart. And the voice you listen to will determine the next move you make. You see, these four men, I, I have to imagine, is they're like, man, we walked all this way. We got our buddy. He's sitting there just like, what's the deal, guys? What's going on? Like, <laughs> I can't even see the door. There's no way we're getting in. And it's going to get late. We got to get your broke butt back over the mountain. And we, there's, there's, it ain't going to work, man. I'm sorry, not today. And I have to imagine that one of these guys was like, no. No, this guy has been healing and casting out demons and proclaiming the kingdom of God. We haven't heard a prophetic word in over 400 years, and this man is walking with authority. We're not taking no for an answer. We came all the way here. We set aside our day, and every day in their life meant life or death, whether they got food on the table or not. We all set aside our day, put our families on the back burner to see God move for our friend, our brother, whoever he was. We're not taking no for an answer. I don't care if the door's too packed. I don't care if no one will acknowledge us. I don't care if we're all hearing doubt in our minds right now. We're not taking no for an answer because this man has been healing. And the Lord said that when his his Messiah would come, that this would be our experience. We are not taking no for an answer. Our friend is getting healed today. And they probably sat around and said, well, what do, you, what do you suppose we do? We can't get in. We can't hear what he's saying to even agree with, to, to just align ourselves with the word. We can't see him doing miracles and be like, I'll receive that. You know, like we, we can't do any of this stuff. They, there's nothing we can do to get in there. And I imagine that this one guy, I really like this one guy. I don't know which one it is, but one of these guys is awesome. And he goes, let's cut into the roof. Let's tear Jesus's roof right off his house and just lower him down. Yeah, I don't know if that's a good idea. He's a pretty big deal. Uh, and all our, all our leaders, all the, all the, the Pharisees and scribes, all the people that we look up to, and they tell us when we've been bad and when we've been good, if we can or cannot go to temple. Our entire social structure, our governmental structure outside of Rome, everything in our life de it depends on these guys' good blessing on our life. They're in there too, and if we tear off that roof, we could all be a lot worse than paralyzed. I don't care. I don't care what we look like. I don't care what it costs. We're getting our friend in front of the Lord. We're getting him into this place. We're going to see what Jesus can do because he's the only hope that we have. And so they climb up on this roof. And I mean, it, people were smaller back then, so they're more my size. Um, <laughs> yeah, Gabe. <laughs> and uh, so, but there's probably like they're cutting at least a two foot by six foot hole into a guy's roof. That's crazy. And I, and I can imagine what this looks like as Jesus is sitting there telling them about the kingdom of God, talking about repentance, talking about the life and all the things that, that, that he came to speak, the freedom that he was coming. He's probably telling some parables that were just amazing and got people's heads scratching. And all of a sudden, dirt and straw and clay starts to just fall down on their heads as hands start poking through and ripping up poking through and ripping up and stuff's falling. And, and I can see all these Pharisees, all these religious leaders sitting there and they're, and they're starting to look up and they're like, what is going on? And they're, they're starting to, to, to moan and, and just get upset. 
And, and Jesus is all the dust on. You can't really look up because it, the light starts to pierce through and it's just debris in the air and it's floating and it's disgusting. People are starting to cough from not being able to breathe well. And all of a sudden, you just see Jesus sitting there with his head down, his eyebrows catching the dust, and he's just smiling because he can feel the hunger breaking through. He can feel the hunger start to push through this roof. He can feel the hunger of four men. And when it finally starts to clear, he looks up as this man's getting lowered. You see four faces lowering a friend down to the floor. And this poor paralyzed man's getting lowered to the floor. And you can imagine the Pharisees now, they're grumbling, is starting to get vocal. And, and they're starting to say, how, how undignified is this? You just tore into a man's house. These are people of law and of prominence here. How dare you come bursting in? How rude that you would come in. Why would you bother the teacher's time when he's sitting with the people that matter? Why would you come before him in this way? You've ruined the whole floor. You've ruined this whole experience. You, you crowded yourself in when other people were waiting patiently outside and you cut in. How rude, how obstinate are you? How arrogant are you to lower this man down? And I imagine Jesus is just looking at this man, and he's just, just welling up with awe and love for him. Just, just awe. Just like, oh my God, he just tore my roof off. I'm not even mad. This dude's crazy, and I love it. And what does he say to him? He looks at him, he goes, take heart, my son. And basically, like, don't worry. Let all your anxieties, let them all just Wash away. Don't you worry about a thing. I see you. I see what you've been through. I see you. You take heart right now. I see you. And your sins are forgiven. Got there to, came there to get healed, but Jesus did something else first. He said, I'm not only concerned about what's going on in your natural life, I'm going to take everything away. You see, you have to understand is what they thought at that time is that if you had calamity or tragedy in your life, it was because sin brought it upon you every time. Jesus speaks to that, that that does happen. Paul speaks to that in Corinth, but that's not the case for all pain and suffering. We do not bring it upon ourselves. We have a very real enemy who is prowling around like a roaring lion looking to kill, steal, and destroy. But for Jesus to tell this man his sins are forgiven is to, is to tell them so much more than just you're okay. It's basically say that you, you have value as you are. You have done nothing wrong. You haven't deserved the suffering you're going through. I see you. I love you. And you're okay with me. I don't care you tore my roof open. I'm, I'm impressed that you were audacious enough to put your own dignity and self-image on the line to meet me. And the Pharisees grumble. And Jesus goes, why do you have this wickedness in your heart? You see, they were, they were trying to, they, were, they didn't understand God's heart that he wanted to forgive. They thought God was up like this mean judge, only forgiving some as he chose, but God's desire was to forgive. And Jesus goes, just so that you know that I can do this, watch this. Get up and take your mat and go home. The man pops up and he walks out. He walks out. Maybe for the first time in his life, maybe first time in years, we don't know. But there's something I want us to walk away from tonight as we, we consider this. They were hungry enough to break the rules and cut open the roof. And I don't mean sinning, to go sin, do whatever you can to get God to listen to you. What I'm talking about is, are you hungry enough to let your self-created picture of what you being dignified before the Lord looks like, be shattered and come to him completely vulnerable and bare and willing to do whatever it takes to be in his presence. David danced before God and his wife said it was dishonor and he said, I'll do even more so than this because of the joy of being in the presence of God. Noah built a boat for hundreds of years while people mocked in the middle of a drought because he wanted to be a friend of God. Abraham was willing to sojourn into a land that wasn't his and leave his family and trust in a promise at the age of 100 that God would do something, not because Abraham was special, but because God said he would do it. 
Moses led two plus million people out of Egypt, the strongest nation on the earth at that time, without waging war. Esther had the courage to step into the king's palace when it could cost her life to ask for mercy for her people. Ruth had the audacity to sleep at Boaz's feet, unbeknownst to him, and trick him into thinking he had slept with her so that she would not be an unmarried woman, a foreign unmarried woman in Israel. People were willing to break the cultural, social, normal rules to get into God's favor all over Scripture. Last week, Jehoshaphat tore everyone else's idols down to bring renewal into his country and called everyone to eat, to not eat, to fast for however long before they go into battle. You want to go swing swords around in the middle of the, the Israeli, Israeli sun after you haven't eaten for a week or two? Yeah, good battle plan, buddy. See, God isn't looking for us to have our well-contrived ideas, our cultural expectations of what it looks like to, to pursue Him. He's looking for people that have a hunger to go, I don't care what this looks like, but Lord, I have to have more of you. And it doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter even if the mess, even if it gets a little messy and people start judging me for pursuing you and for praising you and for trusting in your promises and crazy scenarios and people tell me I'm going to lose everything. I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to see your face in the land of the living. I'm going to be able to shout at the end of this experience because of your promises that you are a good, good God and that you always deliver on your word. There is nothing that you can't do. It says that when we know the love of God for us, the height, the depth, the width, and the length, and that we come to understand that he can do more than we can ever imagine or even ask. In other words, if you've thought God couldn't do it or he might be able to, he's already miles ahead of you. He's fathoms beneath you. He's light years ahead of you, and he's already provided it behind you. There's nothing God can't do if he's made a promise in your life or if there's a promise in his word that if you don't cut off the roof of your contrived idea of what worshiping God looks like and just get free before him, get vulnerable and open and let him do some work, there's nothing he won't do to meet a hunger like that. Heaven cannot ignore a hunger like that. And God will release his favor on your life. I don't know what that'll look like. Because it's not according to our desires, it's according to his promises. But favor will fall like you've never experienced before. And you will walk out of that season of life as, I didn't even know he could do that. I've never seen anything like this before. Are you hungry yet? Can I have the band come back on the stage, please? Thanks, guys. Jesus just doesn't forgive us of our sins to give us salvation for a later life. The word salvation in the Greek that's used over and over again in the New Testament is the same word that's used when Jesus says, your faith has healed you. The sozo. If you can believe that God loves you and your sins are forgiven because of the work that Jesus did on the cross, then that is the same faith. When Jesus says, if it, what is it for a man to forgive sins, and so that you know that I have authority to do such a thing, I'm going to tell him to get up off this mat. It's the same faith that saves you as the same faith that sets you free. You don't need more faith. You just need to understand that it's the same in God's eyes. Jesus is saying it's the same. When Jesus would say you've been healed and been saved, he'd use the same word twice. There's no difference in his mind of taking you all the way for eternity to be blessed by him, and, and to know him as it is for him to change your circumstances in this life and to show you the goodness that he has for you in this life. That's all he did while he was here, is proclaim that he was here to set the captives free, to say that this is the year of Jubilee where all debts are paid and people are set free, to, to heal the lame and the, and the broken, that to give blind men sight and deaf men ears to hear. God is still in the same business today. He didn't change because it's another, cent it's another couple centuries later. What would getting hungry look like? Because it doesn't look like wanting it more. It looks like being willing to do something crazy that maybe you've never done before to 
to see God move in a way that you've never seen him move before. And if we're doing the same thing over and over again, God's not speaking and God's not moving, well, that's insanity. If you do the same thing over and over again, expect different results. Maybe it's time. Maybe it's time to pursue the Lord, to actually not just desire him, but to have a hunger that changes your lifestyle, have a hunger that changes your week, a hunger that changes your job, a hunger that changes your family, a hunger that actually makes Jesus the thing that you cut things out of your schedule for, that makes Jesus the thing that you deny yourself to find, makes Jesus the thing that you will come for at all, at any cost. And when Jesus says to do something crazy, okay, let's go. So they have two more songs to play, and this is my challenge as we wrestle with this thing. Lord, what is this thing in my life? Whether it's a sin, it's a struggle, a relationship, an addiction, just a desire for his word and his presence, a prayer life, whatever this thing, this burden you're carrying, and, and you want to not have a desire, but you want to have a hunger. I, I'm going to challenge you to do this tonight. I'm going to challenge you to come up and hit your knees in front of the altar to do something different than maybe you don't feel comfortable because it might actually put you in front of other people's line of sight. How much do you want it? I promise if we start a lifestyle of hunger, we'll experience more of heaven on earth every day. Let's stand in worship. Come forward as the Lord brought you. These people... And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. So go through. Go through the gates. Prepare the way for the people. Build up. Build up the highway. Clear it of stones. Lift up a signal over the peoples. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the ends of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And you shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you shall be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. We just thank you. We thank you, God, that you, you are the God who searches the heart. You, that you weigh us according to, to the motives of our heart, Lord. According to your gospel, and your gospel is the good news that you came. And that you were the first one to tear the roof off of expectations. That you got victory by dying. And by raising from the dead, not by conquering with force or with might, but by humbling yourself as a servant all the way to the point of death on a cross that you tore the roof off the establishment of what people thought it was to interact with your father, what people thought it was to worship you, to know about what, good, what a good God was, how loving and gracious and kind and merciful you are. 
And Lord, tonight we stand before you and, and we admit that th there are places in our lives that we don't want to be exposed. There's things that are uncomfortable to do, even, especially in public, Lord. But if you have something for us that you would help us, Lord, we believe. But help our unbelief to tear the roof off of our preconceived ideas of what this is supposed to look like so that you can move freely within us, so that you can heal, that you can speak, and you can make moves of things happen that we never imagined or even asked for, that you would do something great in this house, you'd do something great in this city, you would restore families, that you would tear apart all depression from people's thoughts, that they would never have a thought of it again, that you'd bring healing to broken, broken bodies and broken homes. Holy Spirit, we need you to show up in power. Help us tear the roof off. Help us have a hunger to do what is unexpected, to do what is unconventional, to do whatever it takes as you call us to meet you in that place, to see you do a new thing, to pour out your Spirit like never before. I don't want to live in my current understanding, Lord. Bring me closer to you. Bring me closer to you. Lord, we praise you. We thank you, Jesus, for your kindness, for your patience, for how long you suffer us operating in our own understanding, and yet you continue to have favor for us regardless. But Lord, we want to operate in your way of thinking. Renew our minds. Cleanse our hearts. Bring us closer to you. We just give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 He, Gabe, Rainy, Cole, thank you guys so much. God bless you. You guys just give them a big round of applause for leading us in worship tonight. May the Lord bless you guys as you go forward and just open up doors for your ministry and, and just give you revelation of how to just continue to love people more and more. We are so honored and blessed to have you here tonight. Thank you so much. All right. If you're hungry, sign up for the washing. Don't let this stop. Find a, find a place in your schedule, two hours. Grab some people around. There's people around here. Grab two or three other people around you. Find a slot that's open. And come seek the Lord together. As we, want it, we just want to see Him do something radical in this city. All right, God bless you. We love you and we'll see you next week.